It's more than just something you need to get going in the morning. Although that helps. The American coffee culture supports a $48 billion retail industry with an estimated 400 million cups of coffee consumed each and every day. Served at home, on the job, and on the go. But Hawaii, Puerto Rico, and now California grow the only American coffees, so the overwhelming majority must be imported. Almost 20% of the total world production. So my coffee travels have taken me all over Latin America, and then in Africa, Ethiopia, Tanzania, Kenya, Zambia. As the buyer Asia, for Milwaukee-based Colectivo Ruben Coffee Ruben Roasters, Al Lu travels the world yeah. looking for coffees that fit the company's specialty profile. Specialty coffee is a higher end product, but one that, at least in North America, has become very readily available. But what makes different coffees taste the way they do? No. No. The answer is complex. And like any agricultural product, includes multiple factors all the way along the supply chain. Weather patterns, processing decisions, and finally, roasting. There are so many gems in so many different places. We get to have the pleasure of discovering these coffees and we get to choose what we like and what we want to feature. Finding unusual products can be rewarding, but in the end, business decisions revolve around finding a buzzworthy beverage. Coffee people will drink. We have to do a cupping just to look at the bones of the actual coffee. Ultimately, the coffee has to hold up on its own in the cup for us to say, yes, we're going to buy that. A cupping is a tasting ritual, not unlike a wine tasting complete with prescribed procedures designed to get to the heart of a coffee's character. Smelling the dry fragrance and the wet aroma are our first two steps during cupping to evaluate the fragrance. Notes are copiously taken each step of the way. As the cupping evolves into a symphony of slurps, Bits, and more slurps. When these professional tasters do a cupping and they're slurping, right, they're really aerating that coffee so that those molecules become volatile. So they leave the liquid and come up through their nose so they can really experience that flavor more. Matt Hardings is a professor of chemistry at American University and author of Chemistry in Your Kitchen. He says that the concept of terroir, used in winemaking to highlight regional environmental influences, applies to coffee as well. The flavor of coffee comes from a number of different places. Certainly where the coffee is grown has a big effect. Not only in the, the mineral content of the soil where the trees are growing, the microbiome, the local microflora of the region where the coffee is grown are gonna digest the fruit on the outside of that coffee bean. And as they digest that fruit, they're making their own molecules. Tiny molecules have big flavors, big aromas, and they make some really interesting notes that make very unique coffees. There's this whole pantheon of different flavors and tastes that can be discovered in coffee, and there's actually a coffee taster's wheel, it's like a chart, with all these different flavor notes that can be found in coffee and often are. Chocolate, milk chocolate, dark chocolate, baker's chocolate, 
we're looking at fruit, peach, cherry, yellow cherry, Rainier cherry, Bing cherry versus dark cherry. A hint of this, a suggestion of that, but no real grapes or blueberries were harmed in the making of this coffee. Turns out they're just simple reference points we can all understand. They're just flavor notes. It's not like there's any additive or flavoring agent, um, natural or artificial, that's added to a coffee during processing to give it that flavor. Like a papaya. Mm -hmm. Yep, a little mandarin orange. Of course, taste is always subjective. <laughs> <laughs> Making connections with small-scale farmers and coffee producers, Lou experiences firsthand how their decisions can impact the final product. You can take a coffee from the same place, process it different ways, and what you end up with in the cup, you wouldn't know that it started with the same base, the same fruit. That's right, fruit. Picked off the tree when ripe. The coffee bean is actually the seed. And processing refers to the different methods to remove the anatomical layers, pulp, mucilage, and parchment, to get to the core. Natural processing is perhaps simplest, usually resulting in fruit-forward, full-bodied coffees. The cherries are left to dry, kind of like raisins, until they turn dark and harden, and then they're sent to the mill to strip the dried skin and fruit and parchment shell off of the coffee seed, or bean, if you will. Washed coffees are depulped first, and then fermented in a bath of water. Typically for 12 to 36 hours, to remove the sticky mucilage. The beans are then dried and sent to the mill to remove the parchment. Generally speaking, wet processed or washed coffees uh, tend to have higher acidity and can also pick up a lot of fruit notes in washed coffees, citrus especially, grapefruit, lemon, and also floral notes. Typically, Processing decisions are based on traditional practices. But sometimes, producers experiment and create new ways of doing things. Like honey processing, pioneered by Colectivo's Costa Rican supplier, Beneficio Las Lajas. Honey processed coffee has nothing to do with bees honey. Uh, we don't use honey to process it. We definitely don't use honey to roast it. A middle ground method Honey actually refers to that sticky mucilage, which remains on the bean after depulping in a short wash, and then is allowed to dry before the milling. In a way, processing can reinforce the environment where a coffee is grown, providing roasters the raw material and flavors to work with and hopefully enhance. the process of roasting a coffee bean, you are reacting the proteins in the bean with a sugar that's in the bean. Every roaster has their own way that they do things, but if you can get interesting flavors from the bean itself, some of those flavors are going to remain in the coffee bean during the roasting process, and you can make something that a consumer might really enjoy, something that surprises them. Light roasts tend to retain more of the original bean, varied and distinct flavors from its origin and processing, and may be more likely to satisfy the growing thirst for new options, long a hallmark of the specialty market. Especially coffee consumers are interested in trying new things, because specialty coffee at one point was a new thing. It wasn't the same coffee that you would get at, um, let's just say, a convenience store or gas station or out of your grandmother's cupboard. It was something unique and something um, with a different flavor profile. So when you have that next cup of joe, be it a pour over, espresso, 
or latte? Drink in all that goes into making a seemingly deep black void full of flavor.